Our next speaker is Brant Arsenault. Brant is a partner with 9.8 Capital, an integrated strategic and financial services firm focused on companies in the space technology sector. He has 30 years of capital markets experience and fintech experience, both as an owner operator and as a member of senior management with top tier banks. Mr. Arsenault, please. Thanks, Thanks for the introduction. Um, maybe I'll do um, a, uh, a little uh, background on me and then uh, I think my conversation is gonna plug right into where uh, Tim left off. So. As said, I was 30 years on Wall Street. Um, that was my backup plan to being an astronaut. I actually engineered my whole education, my undergrad in electrical engineering and neural networks, my postgrad in electrical engineering and neural networks to become an astronaut. Um, I still have the re rejection letter from the Canadian Space Agency, which sent me into a tailspin and started thinking about what else I could do. And I, I did my, um, my research up in Scotland and I went down to London and answered an ad that were looking for quants to, that understood nonlinear stochastic algorithms and other mathematic techniques for the, cal the calculation of Basel I. And I said, I don't know what Basel I capital is, uh, but I know all the math. And I walked onto the trading floor at JP Morgan, I think in 93, 94, and I just fell in love with it. So the backup plan was great. I did it for 30 years, building trading and risk systems, building alternative uh, trading systems, marketplaces, things of that nature. And I very much enjoyed it. Most recently, um, my corporate job was CIO of Bank of Montreal. Um, and, uh, and I left that to start a fintech company, which was uh, the mandate was to build a massively, trading, uh, massively scalable trading system. And I thought that was going to be my last fintech job. And I would use that, that little bit of wealth to do what Elon and Jeff did and take my half a billion dollars and get into space. It didn't happen exactly like that, um, but I did make some great connections, including some people in Toronto, uh, Chris Hadfield and people like that, that kind of uh, encouraged me to get into the space industry. And I, I was asking myself how, you know, what type of skill should I use? I am an engineer, although I, I haven't exercised that skill in a long time. Uh, and people said, you know, you, you know a lot about capital, you know about um, uh, markets and, 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 um, and strategic matters within companies, why don't you help space companies that way? And that's really how I, I jumped into the industry and started helping companies. And I, I was thinking about all the different infrastructure, financial infrastructure that's gonna be required in a large industry like this, a large, um, an industry that's gonna require a lot of capital. And, and you know, there's other industries that require a lot of capital. There's, there's lots of capital intensive industries, but space has some idiosyncratic nature to it that a lot of the companies need capital quite early on in their, in their um, life cycle. Uh, so there are some really interesting nuances. And I started thinking about all the different sources of capital in, in this industry, right from early stage, from bootstrapping, to, to venture capital, to private equity, um, to banks. Uh, will there be specialized banks that, that uh, specialize in this industry? To exchanges, is there going to be a, a specialized commodities, a commodity exchange that first, maybe you can buy futures and options on launches to hedge your, hedge your risk on, on the volatility of that. And eventually, can, you, can I buy a future or an option on moon water? Or, or Mars water. And that's really interesting. And I think, you know, when that does happen, that'll signal a very um, sophisticated capital markets. Uh, but I want to first, uh, so that's kind of the background. I want to go back a little bit, uh, which we all, regardless of what uh, aspect of the industry we're playing in finance or at, you know, within a space company, um, we, we talk about, and that is explaining the value of space to, to non-space companies, because a lot of us, are somewhat zealots in space and we don't need to be convinced and we kind of jump right over caring that your main, main street person may not know. And I think it's an onion when you look at trying to describe the value of space. And on the outside of the onion is business to government or B to G. And I think that's easy to explain because the governments and government agencies have mandates that are getting value from uh, uh, the developing economy of space. And then B to B, 
you know, the value of B2B, that's very easy to explain to businesses as well, I think. But when you get to B2C, your everyday person, it starts to get difficult. And, and, and Tim brought up GPS and everybody uses GPS. It almost gets a little, a, a little boring using a, a GPS. But, you know, there are other things, a lot of earth observation um, companies that are detecting wildfires and, and things of that nature that are going to impact the public at some point. And, and they're going to see, I think it's going to be self-evident at some point, the value of space. But I think why I bring it up is it, this is going to be a constant duty of anyone in the space industry to continually educate the public. Because as the capital market forms, the public will get involved and the public will invest in space. Um, it's happening a little bit now, but eventually there'll be a big part of the capital markets. And, and I think that that's important. Um, so going back to what uh, Tim was talking about, the need for a bank, um, when I started getting involved in different entities, including early stage <clears throat> platforms for raising company for, for companies and, and helping out certain uh, uh, venture capitalists and if you think about the sophistication of capital that starts out with bootstrapping and friends and family, which is at one end of the, the spectrum, and at the other end of the spectrum is your private equity, your alternatives, and your, your kind of um, um, endowment funds and, and retirement funds. Uh, there's all kinds of mechanisms that get involved into the, to, into the capital markets to, to make it work. Um, and when you think about uh, a development bank, um, it's really interesting because I think the development bank takes a lot of the volatility out of the transition of governments uh, because they have different mandates and different ways to appropriate funds to certain projects. And a development bank can take a little bit of volatility out, uh, out of that. And really what it needs to do is create that. Uh, one thing I think it should do is focus on infrastructure. Because if you think about uh, capital accumulation, a lot of capital flows into an industry or an economy and it can get wasted. Uh, and we saw, and usually we call those bubbles, right? That capital grows and grows and grows and it bursts. And there is very little left of the value that some of the capital created. And if we think about the internet, for instance, in 95, and, and, and I was at JP Morgan and we sold a company to a uh, Silicon Valley company in 98, we weren't talking about Google or Priceline or Amazon. We were talking about Cornyn up in New York, pulling fiber to see how much they can pull, building the infrastructure of fiber optics. We were talking about Cisco and Bay Networks. How could we build better routers and switches? That was, <clears throat> they're the companies that when that bubble burst, they were left. And that was the infrastructure of the internet. <clears throat> now, what we, we don't want to see that in the space industry. We don't want to see a bubble and all that wasted capital evaporate and we have a little kind of nugget. If that nugget could really be focused on and say, okay, that is infrastructure. And what is infrastructure are the kind of fundamental things that when, the, when those assets are in space, the force multiplier of new companies on top of them will take off. And that is access, right? That is communication, that is compute. That are all that is habit habitability. These are the things that will make space 2.0 or 3.0 really accelerate. Um, and I think the 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 formation of a of a development bank, either fully owned by the government or partially owned, is a, a great idea because it can make direct loans uh, again to companies that are building that infrastructure. It can make direct equity placement. It can even make loans into private equity firms and other cap other parts of the mechanism within the capital markets to, to kind of take that volatility out, out of it. So I think it's a very important part of the capital markets. Not all industries get these type of capabilities, but but I think it, it's it's quite quite important. Um, yeah, so I, th I think, you know, that, that's why I got involved with um, Space Corp and, and Tim's concept. I think it's going to be a great, uh, almost like a backstop um, or uh, a wicket keeper for people outside of America uh, to kind of to kind of protect the the other capital in the industry and and uh, make sure that that infrastructure gets built. Terrific. Brand, thank you very much. Um, it's it's not well known, but my uh, 
my background a really long time ago in between the Marine Corps and working in space was I, I was an investment advisor uh, back in 19, the 1990s, the early side of the 1990s, before the dot-com bubble. Um, and uh, I think the, the folks on, uh, on this call need a bit of an explanation. Um, uh, not everybody really understands what an investment bank really is, what this kind of capital bank really is. A lot of folks are thinking Bank of America and Wells Fargo. That's not it. So I need you to go a little bit deeper into what this mechanism might look like, if you can. Yeah, so, so typically a development bank really starts out with a mandate. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I meant or... development bank. I said investment bank. Yeah. I, I do know the difference. I do know the difference. Yeah, and, well, and, and they're similar. You know, an investment, the investment bank is doing the same thing, but it's very opportunistic and will do it to anyone that will pay. <laughs> it doesn't have a, a very strong mandate. So a development bank starts out with a mandate. And in this case, it is to build that underlying infrastructure for space. And the, and the reason is to create sustainability and a platform for future growth to avoid the inefficient use of capital down the road. Because if you layer capital on top of a infrastructure capital, you'll avo avoid these kind of balloon um, type of bubbles um, and irrational exuberance that a lot of that we've seen. Right. We've seen that in many, many cases. And these type of things avoid that. If you look at the, the transcontinental railway, first of all, what they the first time they they they, uh, they they had two attempts or a couple of attempts of making that right. And the first time they really didn't explain the value because why why do people want to go right. to the West Coast, right? Um, the, you know, the, the gold rush was one reason, but they started to get very very well educated on on understanding how to explain that. Um, but that, that railway, they gave incentives to two companies to build that railway, and they gave them land rights, and they gave them mineral rights uh, to hedge against the, the success of the railway. So an invest, a, a development bank starts out with a mandate and then chooses projects that fulfill that mandate. And I think that w the, the, the development bank will build up consensus on what those projects are and start funding funding those um, those programs. Um, and what that does is, is creates long-term value and takes out some uh, volatility. So for instance, if a development bank was around during the transcontinental railway, they might've thought about some projects to to avoid the mercury problem that, that the, the gold rush created in, in the West. Um, and that's one thing, you know, one example is an investment bank should look at debris and, and, and orbital congestion, right? right? As we build this platform and we get more, more activity into Leo, Mio, and Geo, um, if we start having collisions and problems, that is gonna slow down the capital formation. Um, so they have to look at a lot of that, that, that you need financial structure, you need physical infrastructure, and you need legal and policy infrastructure. And then uh, a development bank will look at all three of those to really um, accelerate capital formation and the sustainability of that capital formation. So I'm gonna break it down a little further. Um, when we work on projects, we work on hardware, we work on finance and business, we work on um, uh, the outreach component and we work on uh, uh, fr framework, uh, legal policy, that sort of thing. And yeah. I mean, in, in, in a very positive way, this event that we're having is that outreach component. But this bank really wraps these four elements around and says, all right, we're going to look at hardware. That's important. Like that's that's what this is all about is the infrastructure. Um, as you described earlier, the, the telecom infrastructure was still standing after a lot of the dot com bubble burst. Um, that's really what we're aiming for, but you can't do that without really understanding business operations, logistics, and finance. You can't do that without outreach and telling your story to the community, and you certainly can't do that without the laws and policies. So in a way, and I'm putting words in your mouth, I want you to clarify, in a way, this development bank 
takes on those responsibilities and say, we're going to kind of help chart a future, right? This is the wild, wild west. That was your reference a minute ago with the, um, uh, with the railroad. We're in the wild, wild west now somebody needs to chart that future is that the role that this that this development bank is kind of taking on that's that's a big burden if that's if, if that's where we're going well it's part it's part of building consensus it's not it's not um responsible for it but it it's it's part of that process of building consensus and connecting people and getting the conversations and funding the right the the, the right platforms and the, and the right the right projects that build that sustainability. Um, there was a paper by Kevin Barry uh, that talks about it. He used a metaphor of a garden, right? That we want to build a garden and grow plants and sell the vegetables and fruits, but we need to invest and underwrite the risk of building the garden, the raised bed, the lattices, the things that are going to promote the growth. Um, so, you know, it's great to find customers for Infrastructure 1.0, and you will find a lot of uh, customers, especially B2B customers. And, and the government and, and the government agencies are going to be continue to be important customers of 1.0. But really, it is underwriting that infrastructure for the, the, the end customer, which will, be, will come in a greater amount after that's built. Cool. So let's talk about customers. There's two or three customer uh, questions in the in the chat. Let's talk about who the customer of this development bank is, and, yeah, and maybe so, the downstream of their customers. Yeah. So um, and and Tim can jump in if he's still on too. But I, I, the idea is direct loans to companies that are are building the infrastructure that align to the mandate. There's also um, loans to, to private equity companies and other capital infrastructure companies that are aligned and investing into these, these type of infrastructures. Um, so that, that, that's the main, the main kind of pool of uh, customers, categories. When, when we build this thing, uh, you, know, you, said, you said something that's going to concern some people, which is, you know, direct loans to companies. Um, yeah. Obviously, I'm a big fan of that plan, but but who safeguards this? Who um, who says this is a good loan, this is a bad loan? I know that we don't have the standards yet. We don't even have the organization yet. So I don't want to put you on the spot. But you know, in in big concepts, what might that look like? It'll be set up very similar to, well, it'll be set up just like a bank where they'll have a risk committee and an investment committee, uh, and and they'll make those those risk decisions and adjudication decisions against the mandate and the quality of the companies. Um, and because these are loans, they're going to be you know later stage companies, not not early stage companies. There there could be some early stage companies, of course, and I think there is some thought being put into deploying some of the capital through equity, which is a whole different kind of capability that not a lot of development banks have. But it is a thought to kind of look at that capability. So, in the in the simplest terms, if uh, if a company has customers it's probably fundable if it doesn't have customers it probably isn't fundable would that be a, a safe generality or am i missing some nuance yeah i think it's a, it's easier for a risk committee and a bank to to fund companies with revenue um but there is going to be i believe there's going to be other mechanisms within the organization to do kind of at revenue um, um, type of companies, but this is very much a traditional mechanism for giving out loans. Um, so yeah, it, it'll follow that type of process. So we have, uh, we have two, we have a VC and we have a investment banker on this, on this call. We also have, um, uh, a representative speaking in his own capacity from the, from the U S space force. Um, there are, national security concerns and implications to this bank. Um, would it also, uh, would it also 
um, commit resources to uh, things that help the national security. And, and I'm, I'm being vague on purpose because I think that, you know, there's a lot of stuff there that hasn't really been sorted out. But, um, uh, you know, is, is the customer of the national defense a big, you know, a, a qualifying customer? Yes, I believe so. I mean, if, if Tim, if Tim's on, I think uh, Tim has some answers to this, but I believe so. Okay. So I'm going to move on from the, the customer's question. I'm going to switch back to um, how does this thing work? All right. So we, with the space act that's being proposed, uh, assume that we get the thumbs up on it. Um, do you have a time frame for when this might get stood up? How long is it going to take from an operations perspective? Or is it just too soon to tell? It's a little soon, but we do have some, you know, we do have a, a, a strategy that is forming now that the original idea was to get the infrastructure act uh, passed as, as a, a fully um, uh, development bank. But there's also a thought to get it attached to other infrastructure bills that are floating in Congress now. Um, and we're just, we're discussing that strategy now. Okay. Um, when, uh, what do you, we've been asking the, the, the speakers yesterday and the day before, we're, we're putting a box around everything from the ground to the moon and everything between 2020 and 2020. 35, just a 15 year window. And it's not a rolling window. It's like, you know, in a couple of weeks, it's going to be 2021. It doesn't, this doesn't move the window to 2036. It's a hard stop at 2035. Can you kind of pull out your crystal ball and say, you know, what does 2022 look like? That's not very far away at all. What does 2025 look like? And if those two things happen, what does 2035 look like? And, and you know, you're an you're a investment advisor. It's your job to have a crystal ball. So we're counting on you. I think, you know, Tim has a better view into these plans. So I'll let him go first and then I'm going to add my opinion. Okay, cool. Great. Tim? Yeah. Um, I think at the end of the day, the... The, the 2035 window is um, too far out. Okay. Not because, not because we can't see that far, but because nobody would believe the pace of exponential change between now and then. Um, 15 years ago, I would not have believed, and I am a stereotypical early adopter, I would not have believed the capabilities of my smartphone or the quality of my new Xbox. Um, and those are benign right. improvements that have scaled exponentially. And so in a recent interview, I was asked, what, what does space look like in a hundred years? And I was talking yeah. with Lila about one of the written responses I was giving that included mentioning a billion people living in space. And that sounds fantastical because that's well north of a 10th of the current population of Earth living in space. But if we even remotely believe that space is on an exponential curve, which all evidence suggests that it is, um, we not only need a Moore's law for space technological development, but we need a way to communicate that to the public that doesn't sound like we're talking about Star Wars. Right. Um, and so when I start presentations and talk about space elevators or space-based solar power, I say by the end of this decade, and I get looked at sideways because that's crazy. And it is. So is going to the moon in the 60s. Everything's crazy until we do it. Uh, we need a lot. There's a lot to do. But at this point, we just have to do it. Okay, uh, we've got, uh, we've got four minutes here. 
Brant, do you want to chime in quick? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so mine's probably a little more um, boring than that. I, and, and drawing on my experience, and, and I know the internet is not a, a, the, a, an exact analogy, but you know, I, I think 20, 2030, we're still building infrastructure, um, uh, including access. Uh, continually involving uh, in improving access and the price compute. Uh, and I mean general compute. Uh, there's a lot of earth observation and data relay companies and communication companies. That's going to turn into a general compute capability. And I think that'll continue to evolve. And you see Amazon and Microsoft and, and Google getting involved. And then communications, pure communications. And then the last one is habitability. I think this will continue to get better and better and better. Um, and not not to discount the exploratory uh, uh, projects going to Mars and Moon during that period, but it won't be of a of a real sustainable com commercial nature until the infrastructure that I mentioned first gets really solid and gets funded by in space commerce, not not NASA, not agencies, but people gaining value from that infrastructure that are kind of end customers. Terrific. Um, Michael Meeling, uh, do you want to ask a super fast question and get a super fast answer? Um, sure. So Mike, going back to what uh, uh, Tim just said, um, and, and, and some parts of the entire discussion, yes, who the customer is matters. Um, and especially from the conversation in, in the chat, um, who is the final customer? Um, not you know NASA, it, 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 if we ever wanna get beyond NASA as the only customer, um, who is the final customer and what value proposition do they need? Um, a lot of the discussions I hear in space right now is everyone selling to everyone else. There is no final, there is no conversation around who the final customer is. Um, and that gets to what is their very, very basic human emotional motivation for wanting to be that customer? What problem are they solving? So I guess the question is for Tim, to justify all that expansion, given a Congress and a government that is explicitly not wanting to be perceived as an expansionist power, what problem are you solving? So the problem we're solving is a stagnant productivity, a slow growth rate, and ultimately a lack of a frontier to bring intellectual dynamism into the, into the fold. And so that, that doesn't answer the, the customer question, um, but the, the customer is ultimately the person who wants to adventure, the person looking to make a change, who seeks a new opportunity, a entrepreneur who doesn't see a future where they're at and looks to move to make that. Just like the westward expansion in the US, just like the first colonists. But unlike those, now we have an opportunity to do that without being an expansionist power. There is no natives to displace. There is no pristine wilderness to deforest. No doubt we will discover we have broken something when we get there but at least we haven't harmed our fellow humans or those of us sharing the world we live in. All right, Lila, it's over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Brant. Uh, really quickly, where can people learn more about you or contact you? Yeah, you can contact me at brant.arsenal at 9.8.net. Excellent, thank you.